Şu an hazırlanıyor ve büyük ihtimalle yayında yayına verecek buraları. Ne biraz bekleyelim. Tamamdır. Bekleyebiliriz. Şu an başlayabilirsin Mehmet. Tamamdır. <gülüyor> değerli arkadaşlar, değerli matematik gönül vermiş arkadaşlar. Hepiniz 9. Bağlı Matematik Buluşmamıza katıldığınız için teşekkür ederiz. 9. Bağlı Matematik Buluşmamız yani Bahar Matematik Buluşmamız ilk bağda düzenlenme, ilk bağda ve son bağda olmak üzere düzenlenmektedir. Ankara'da ve İstanbul'da olmak üzere yaptığımız bir öğrenci çalıştaydı. Öğrenci temel çalıştaydı. Ve bu dönem 9... John Houghton Conway'a ithaf edilen 9. Bağ Matematik Buluşması'nda 1-2 Mayıs tarihlerinde düzenlenmeye karar vermiştik. Ve bu tarihlerde COVID-19 pandemi koşullarından ötürü çevrim içi olarak Zoom uygulamasında gerçekleştirmeye karar verdik. <gülüyor> Etkinliğimizde lisans öğrencilerinin de takip edeceği düzeyde hocalarımız akademik odaklı seminerler verecektir. Ee, i̇çerisinde ayrıca röportajları ve öğrenci konuşmalarını içermektedir. Ee, ben Konuş, yani sözü hocamıza bırakıyorum. Ondan öncesinde bir şu arkadaşımıza. E, merhaba arkadaşlar. E, sunumu İngilizce yapacağım. Hocamız İngilizce, e, Türkçe bilmediği için. E, hello everyone. E, our first talk will be given by Dr. Ayesh Astup Kureshi. Uh, Dr. Ayesha is an assistant professor at Sabancı University and she is going to talk about exploring uh, connections between competitive algebra and combinatoric. Okay, then. <clears throat> Thank you, Busha. Okay, let me share the screen. So you can see the screen, right? Yes, Ojan. Okay, okay, great. First of all, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to give a talk here. Uh, so I've been told that, okay, the uh, our targeted audience is mostly undergraduate students uh, who are looking uh, to learn about different areas in mathematics. So the idea is that, okay, I will introduce some uh, connections that we have in commutative algebra and combinatorics. So for combinatorics, okay, one can get an idea that, you know, when we talk about enumerative combinatorics, uh, when you take a course of discrete mathematics, so you get an idea <laughs> what kind of, uh, I mean, uh, like the underlying, uh, you know, the information uh, that one require. And then uh, when we, we say about commutative algebra, you can just think about a ring, uh, which is commutative. So multiplication is commutative. A times B is equals to B times A. So how these two fields are related, we will explore it a little bit. Uh, so in commutative algebra is basically a translation of, uh, um, you know, what we study in algebraic geometry. Okay, so this is uh, basically how commutative algebra uh, flourished uh, to begin with. And then later in 1970s, uh, due to the work of Richard Stanley, uh, combinatorics became also a very important tool uh, in, in solving many algebraic problem uh, related with commutative rings. Uh, oh, sorry, what is this? A strange line here, okay. So, uh, commutative algebra, uh, basically it, it involves this algebraic tools that we uh, use uh, to study different problems in geometry, uh, in um, uh, topology. And what we do, we try to use more intuitive uh, methods coming from combinatorics to be able to solve this problem. So let me give a very quick and a very uh, brief introduction to this. So in 1960, uh, a distribution problem was suggested by three Indian mathematicians, Anand, Dumir, and Gupta. So they investigated the following combinatorial distribution problems. You know, you have, uh, uh, balls and boxes with certain conditions, you want to distribute these balls or these objects in the given boxes. Okay, this is what distribution problems are. So um, what was their problem? The problem was the following. That suppose that you have n distinct object, each available in R identical copies. So you have a multi-set of n type of object, each object is available R times. And you want to distribute it among n uh, people in such a way that each person receives exactly our objects. 
what can be said about the number H and R of such distribution? So N and R taking them uh, as two variables. So how can we define this H and R? So basically this is the general term of a sequence <clears throat> where you are varying N and R. Uh, and one would like to, for example, know, say something about the generating function of this sequence. So this uh, simple problem, it can be seen in the following way. Uh, okay, there's a spelling mistake, it's structured as follows. So you have a matrix, okay, and the entries of the matrix are integers, uh, positive integers. And what you want to know that your size of the matrix is n cross n, and you want to, uh, uh, you, you, you put these numbers a, i, j uh, in the following way. So it denotes the number of copies of object i that the person j receives. Then given the conditions, uh, of this, this, this distribution problem, what we want to know is that how many such matrices can you form such that the column and row sums are the same and this is exactly equal to R. Okay, so for example here, when you have 15, uh, when your N is equal to 15, so it just basically is that uh, you are distributing uh, these numbers uh, from one to nine, uh, in such a way that all the column and row sums are the same. So it reminds you of what we know as in, um, in, in combinatorics as magic squares, uh, a very ancient object that people used to hang outside their door to keep evil spirits away. It has a long uh, combinatorial recreational uh, this, um, uh, history. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, you can, you can make a Google search. It's, it's quite an interesting topic. So they appear like the, it dates back in uh, like uh, um, in very ancient history. Okay, so now what we would like to know, given any n, how many such magic squares uh, can one make? Then Arendt, Dumir, and Gupta they propose different conjectures of, for these numbers h and r and for their uh, generating function. So, for example, one of the conjecture was the following: that there exists a polynomial of degree n minus one square such that H and R can be approximated by uh, this polynomial. So it's a polynomial-like function. Uh, so in particular, of course, uh, P and R is zero when R is less than, uh, uh, uh, less than N. Uh, so this was one uh, of, um, let's say, one of the conjecture that they proposed at that time. Penne became interested in this work and then he observed the following that if you denote mn to be the set of solutions uh, of uh, this um, uh, h and r, this number, so mn has an algebraic structure of a submonoid of uh, z n, uh, n times n. And then this monoid algebra has cruel dimension n minus one square plus one. So now we are seeing many you know, algebraic names. There's a submonoid, there's a monoid algebra, there's a cruel dimension, a lot of things going on. So, okay. Uh, without giving any definition. So just uh, looking at, okay, what Stanley did. So what he, he, he studied algebraically the solutions. And then by using the theory of Hilbert function, he uh, gave a proof of this conjecture. And while uh, working on the proof, he was able to actually give, uh, strengthen the proof of what we know as upper bound conjecture. So just to give an idea, uh, to, to give the statement of upper bound conjecture. So what do we have? We have a d-dimensional cyclic polytope with n vertices, which is the convex hull of uh, n distinct points on the moment curve. What is a moment curve? It is defined as follows. So you, you have a function from R to Rd, where each uh, t is mapped to t, t square and t to the power d and so on. So these are the convex hulls here. And what our uh, what this upper bound conjecture, which is not a conjecture anymore. Sorry, there is a question. Ah, okay. So what does it say that the cyclic polytopes have maximum possible number of faces for a given dimension and the number of vertices? So the cyclic polytopes, when you will count the faces, they they they um, uh, give you the uh, maximum number of faces there. And then for any triangulation of simplicial sphere of the, uh, dimension d minus one with n vertices, the number of faces are upper, uh, bounded by the number of faces for the cyclic polytopes. Okay, so uh, there is, uh, I mean, I can understand, but don't worry. I mean, you are seeing maybe some names that you are not familiar with, but okay, we will move to uh, some basic <laughs> uh, uh, terminology very soon. 
Anyhow, this conjecture was proposed by Theodore Motskin in 1957. Uh, for simplicial polytopes, it was proved in 1970, and then Richard Stanley strengthened the proof for simplicial sphere in 1975. Why this is related? Uh, why did I start with talking about the distribution problem? Because um, when he studied this distribution problem, he was able to extend those ideas somehow uh, and give uh, uh, and strengthen the proof of this uh, upper bound conjecture, where he used. Um, the theory of simplicial complexes. And then at that time, uh, Gerald Reiner, he already had some result, uh, like the classification of what we call Kohan Macaulay, uh, uh, uh, the rings that are now, now known as Stanley Reisner rings. And then using all those results, <clears throat> this, uh, these results were given. And for this, I strongly recommend um, this reference I've put here. Uh, it's more. It's not a paper. It's more like an autobiography written very beautifully. I mean, Richard Stanley is one of the prominent mathematicians of our lifetime, uh, and uh, it gives an autobiography. You know, when he was an um, uh, uh, uh, elementary school student and then moving to high school, how he became interested in these kind of questions, and how then uh, he uh, gave the proof. Uh, for this upper bound conjecture for simplicial sphere, which was basically the peak uh, of his mathematics career quite early in his age. So it's a, it's a very nice read for um, students. I would really recommend, I mean, uh, to get some inspiration also from there. Okay, now uh, after this work, <clears throat> uh, solving this um, problem uh, that can be described geometrically, um, uh, how okay the commutative algebra became involved and how the combinatorics became involved. Uh, then after this this work, it became it, it started a new trend, uh, starting from 1970. So it is not uh, it's only a couple of decades old this this trend, and uh, it's a very active area of research <clears throat> that you know you have certain combinatorial structure and then uh, you somehow associate let's say an ideal or um, uh, uh, or maybe a monomial subring uh, somehow that you know you whether you would like to study the properties of the combinatorial structure or you would like to solve some algebraic problem related to those ideals etc okay so first we will start from here combinatorial study of square free monomial ideal so what stanley did <clears throat> the idea was the following uh, here so first we fix a field K is a field, okay? So uh, uh, it's a ring, uh, a commutative ring with identity where every element has an inverse, okay? So if you would like to think, uh, you can just take it, for example, set of rational number, okay? Uh, and then we set uh, a polynomial ring in N variables. Okay, so by saying a polynomial ring in N variable, just think about set of all polynomials uh, in variables x1 up to xn and then the coefficients in these polynomials are coming from the field that you have fixed okay now what you do you can define a monomial what is a monomial monomial means only one component binomial would mean where you have sum of or difference of two monomials a polynomial means where you have many monomials you know joined together with addition or uh, subtraction or uh, so on so what is a monomial? Basically, it is just the product of variables. Some of the variables can be identical. So how can we look at them? Uh, you are multiplying different variables. So of course, there will be some exponents from x1 up to xn. You can view these exponents uh, as an element in, uh, uh, as, a, as a n tuple, okay? Where all the elements are bigger or equal to zero. For each i is bigger or equal to zero. If you would like them to be negative also, then it would be a, uh, what we call Lorentz polynomial ring, where the negative powers are also allowed. But okay, we are talking at the moment about just simply the polynomial rings. And for example, this is a monomial. Okay, just the product of variables. When you say a square free monomial, it is the product of distinct variables. So there is no power of any variable that appears. So just distinct variables multiplied together, it would be a square free monomial. Okay, great. Now what we do, 
the very standard way of um, um, uh, associating a combinatorial structure to this algebraic so what is the what is the most standard way it is the following so you take any finite set of square free monomials okay so here a contains r square free monomials so we can associate two kinds of algebraic structures typically one is the square free monomial ideal that is generated by these monomials okay so you just generate a monomial ideal so in particular it is called a square free monomial ideal because its set of generators are square free monomials okay the other structure would be a toric ring what is a toric ring uh, you take this set of monomials and uh, you uh, generate this monomial subring so this is a subring of the polynomial ring uh, in which contains all of these variables x1 up to xn and u1 up to ur they are monomials in these variables so uh, by saying monomial subring so what do you have here in particular simply speaking you have polynomials in which each of the comp so in in a polynomial you have components which are monomials so each of the monomials uh, are a multiple of these uh, fixed uh, monomials okay so this would be your monomial subring simply speaking so here it is r here it should be r also okay so why these toric rings are nice uh, let's say you are fixing these m monomials here you are generating this monomial subring. What you do, you take another polynomial ring in new variables. So let's say these are in the variables x1 up to xn. You take a new polynomial ring in as many variables, as many monomials you have here. Okay, and then you can create a surjective, surjective homomorphism. So each variable in your polynomial ring T, it's mapped to a Dix distinct monomial in your uh, this monomial subring so each ti is mapped to ui this one is sort of generated by the square free monomials and here you have as many variables as many monomials here so this is a surjective homomorphism each of the generator has a pre image okay so it's a surjective homomorphism great now we know from the first isomorphism theorem that t quotient kernel of phi is isomorphic to this uh, a nice ring, toric ring. For those of you who have taken a course in algebraic geometry, they might have heard the word toric varieties. So these toric varieties are exactly the ones which are associated to these toric rings. Okay, so what happens here, by the way, so for this kind of surjective homomorphism, one would like to study this kernel. Why? Because first of all, this kernel is always a binomial ideal. Maybe I have here. Okay, so this is but we call, okay, it was in the previous slide. Let me write it here again. T quotient kernel of phi is isomorphic to K A here. And this kernel of phi is called the toric ideal or the defining ideal of this toric ring. Uh, and uh, this is well known that uh, this toric ideal is always a binomial ideal. And it is not just a binomial ideal, it is in fact a prime ideal. Why? because t quotient kernel of phi again is isomorphic to this ring which is an integral domain so we know that uh, r quotient p if it happens to be an integral domain then p is a prime ideal and so on so uh, th that is why this construction is quite nice because this is one of the most important method to investigate if a given binomial ideal is prime uh, the definition of a prime ideal, okay, you know from the first course in abstract algebra, is easy. If A, B belongs to P, then either A is in P or B is in P, okay. So whenever the product is there, one of the factors should be there. But how do you verify this definition? When you have a, when you have an ideal in your hand, uh, it's, it's not so easy to verify. One of the tool is this characterization that you take the quotient ring and then you see if it is an integral domain, if it has zero divisors or not. So this is one of the, um, a uh, nice um, uh, tool here that we can use to study binomial ideals that when they are prime. Okay, so uh, moreover, this is not just the end of the story. In fact, what we have, if there is a binomial ideal, let's say I is a binomial ideal by saying, by the way, binomial ideal, it means it is generated by binomials, okay? So it is generated by uh, like you have monomials minus some other monomials, so this would be a binomial, let's say F, difference of two monomials. 
and this ideal i has such generators. So a binomial ideal is prime if and only if it can be seen as a toric ideal, you know, of such a surjective homomorphism. If there exists a toric ring such that it is a defining ideal of the toric ring. So uh, this information we will keep in the hand and we will use it in the last part uh, of the talk. Now we continue with the discussion about the square free monomial ideal. Okay. We take a ground set, okay, a finite set with uh, n integers, one up to n. Then uh, we define this simplicial complex. How do we define it? It is a simplicial complex on the vertex set, uh, which is the ground set, one up to n, and it is the collection of the subsets of the power set of this set with the following property. If you have a subset in delta, then all of the subsets of uh, F should also be in delta. Okay, so this is the definition of a simplicial complex. And then the elements that belong to delta, they are called the faces of delta. Okay, and then we uh, define the dimension. So this is not a K vector space dimension at the moment, or just we are, uh, at the moment we are putting this name dimension of delta. It is maximum of the cardinality, the sizes of the subsets that belong to delta minus one. Okay, now, uh, it is always better. This is the nice thing about the combinatorial objects because one can put a picture and then see them in form of a nice figure. So what we have here in this example, this is our delta. So my, uh, our ground set, as you can see, we have five vertices. So I am taking these uh, five vertices, one, two, three, four, five. And uh, delta is the collection of these subsets. So again, as you can see, you have the set one, two, three here. So all the subsets of one, two, three are again inside Delta. So what are the other subsets of one, two, three? I cannot see the screen, okay. So for example, one, two is here, two, three is here, one is here, two is here, three is here. Uh, so, and then, okay, you can take the empty one also. So all of the subsets are here. Similarly for three, four, five and so on. So whenever you have a set, Inside delta, all of these subsets are there. And then we can put a nice uh, geometrical uh, uh, picture to it. What you do, you draw all the five vertices. And then as you can see, this one, two, three, this triangle is shaded. Why? Because this belongs to delta. The triangle two, three, five is not shaded. Why? Because it does not belong to delta. So you can color, uh, you can shade the regions to denote the, you know, in this picture that, okay, what are the faces that belong to Delta and the, the, the, the, the regions which are not shaded? Okay, they do not belong to Delta. So this is a simplicial complex. And then <clears throat> what we do, we do the following. We take the simplicial complex and let's say this vertex set is this ground set N. So one can associate a square free monomial ideal to this delta in the following way. Again, you fix a field, you take the polynomial ring in as many variable, as many vertices do you have in delta. Okay, so you, it is defined on the ground set N, you take a polynomial ring in N variable. Then to each subset in general, to each subset of N, we can, atta we can attach uh, the square free monomial because this is a subset so there is no index repeated. So this will be a square free monomial. So for example, if you have set one, two, three, your monomial will be X1, X2, and X3. So to each subset, okay, we attach a monomial. Good. Now uh, there are different kinds of square free monomial ideals that one can associate with this simplicial complex. So first one that we call facet ideal, you have delta, you take the maximal faces in your delta, okay? And then to those maximal faces, you take, you put them as the index set of your square free monomial. And then you generate an ideal with all such square free monomial. And this is what we call facet ideal. Also what we can do, we can do the following. Those uh, subsets that do not belong to delta, we consider those. So this will be a non-face because this 
the elements of delta are the phases and it does not belong to delta. So this is a non phase. Then to the, these non phases, you can again, of course, attach a monomial and you generate an ideal with that. This ideal is what is called Stanley Reisner ideal due to Richard Stanley and uh, Reisner. Uh, and uh, the ring, the quotient ring of this ideal is called the Stanley Reisner ring, uh, which was one of the more uh, important tool in this, um, you know, what we talked about before in the upper bound conjecture. So this is associated with them. Uh, now let's see an example for this. So what we talked about so far. For, uh, so you have uh, this simplicial complex, right? The one that we just saw. What are the minimal non faces uh, here? So for the non faces, vertices are all faces here because they belong to delta. Now this edge is missing one four. So this is a non phase. It is not included in delta. So one four is here. Then one five, this is also not an edge. So this is also a non phase. Two four, this is also an edge. Uh, sorry, this is also not in the delta. So this is also a non phase. And uh, two three five, as you can see, two three five is not the colored region here. So this is also not a phase of delta. Moreover, okay, you can see that one, three, four, this is also not a phase, but one, four is already not a phase. And this one is contained in this other non phase, one, three, four. So when you will attach the monomial x1, x4, this divides the monomial x1, x3, x4. So when you would like to write the minimal set of generator, considering minimal non phases is already enough. Okay. So now, uh, sorry, I had a problem with my tablet. Everything prepared. Okay. Okay, it works now. Uh, can you see the screen? Everything okay? Yes. Okay, okay. So uh, we take this minimal non faces, uh, we attach these square free monomials, and we generate this ideal with this set of generator. And this is our Stanley um, Reisner ideal for this simplicial complex. For the facet ideal, you will take the maximal faces. Maximal faces here are one, two, three. The other one is uh, three, five, four. Uh, then you have two, five. Uh, you have three, five. And uh, okay, uh, two, three is already included, included here. Three, five is always. So these are the maximal faces here. Okay, this what we have seen in the example when we wrote it uh, exactly here. So these are your maximal faces and the monomials attached to them will generate your facet ideal. Now, wh wh what is so nice about them uh, is the following, that given a simplicial complex, one can attach a square free monomial ideal to it. And given any square free monomial ideal, one can attach a unique simplicial complex to it. So there is a Stanley Reisner correspondence. So every, for every square free monomial ideal, you have this certain simplicial complex. And for every simplicial complex, it can be determined by a square free monomial ideal. And how is it uh, given? Uh, these are the ones, these square free monomial ideals, when you look at them as a Stanley Reisner ideal, you can create your simplicial complex. So it is when you would like to study uh, square free monomial ideals, you can one way of studying them would be the following that you look at them uh, as a Stanley Reisner ideal, you construct the simplicial complex and the properties of the simplicial complex, uh, combinatorial properties, they can describe many algebraic properties of the attached square free monomial ideal. For example, uh, we define the dimension of a simplicial complex, as I wrote before, as the maximum of the size uh, of all the faces that belong to delta minus one. So when you uh, take your uh, Stanley Reisner ring, so this k delta, as we defined before, this is the polynomial ring quotient Stanley Reisner ideal. The dimension here is exactly equal to the dimension of delta plus one. And uh, by the way, here, when we talk about the dimension, this is uh, the cruel dimension. So what you are looking for 
for the cruel dimension here, you would like to see the longest chain of prime ideals in SI delta. You want to construct the longest chain of prime ideal. So the supremum of such a chain would give you the dimension, the cruel dimension of this quotient ring. Uh, and all of this algebraic process, it can be just simply computed by looking at the simplicial complexes. You look at uh, the facets there, and then you look at the facets of the large, uh, of the biggest cardinality, and that just uh, gives you the dimension of this attached quotient ring here. Why, by the way, it is true for those of you who have um, a little bit uh, knowledge about it. So I can, I mean, so this is basically uh, the reason here. When you are looking not just for this Stanley Reisner ring, basically when you are, I mean, for any monomial idea, when you will consider this S quotient I. What is the k vector space basis for this S quotient i? Those monomials that do not belong to your ideal. And basically, this is why we have this result. OK, so uh, one of the emphasis, uh, so the study of square free monomial ideals, OK, it becomes, let's say, in some sense, easy if you can understand the attached simply shell complex in a good way. Uh, but the, the story does not stop here. So uh, uh, after simplicial complexes, now there are many ways of, uh, you know, associating different kinds of combinatorial objects to these square free monomial ideals and also uh, to monomial ideals, okay, where we do not have any restriction on the um, uh, exponents. So for example, one of uh, the tool here <clears throat> is, uh, um, attaching a, a, to a square free monomial ideal generated in degree two, you attach a graph to it. How? So in the following way, you take any simple finite graph by saying simple, okay, we do not want loops uh, because loops uh, will correspond uh, to in some sense, if you have a loop at a vertex. So it means that uh, what I would, have here in the end a monomial of uh, with a square. So we do not want loops, we do not want multiple edges. So a simple finite graph whose vertex set is given as VG and this is the edge set. Then the edge ideal associated with this graph would be the following. So in the edge ideal, what you do, you look at the graph, you look at the edges and to each edge, you associate uh, a monomial Xi, Xj. In the polynomial ring, which has as many variables as many vertices do you have here? This is called the edge ideal associated with a graph. Okay, so of course you can see it as a Stanley Reisner ideal also, but uh, sometimes looking at it as an edge ideal makes things easier. So for example, this is a graph with four vertices. Uh, these are the uh, edges here, uh, sorry. These are the edges here, one, two, one, three, one, four, two, four, three, four. To each edge, we put a degree two monomial. So the edge ideal is generated in degree two because all the generators have degree two. Uh, and to each edge, you are associating a uh, monomial. So this is the minimal set of generator for this uh, ideal. Now, what we have here, let's look at a little bit um, um, uh, some algebraic uh, and homological definitions here. You take a homogeneous ideal in your polynomial ring by saying homogeneous ideal, an ideal which is generated by polynomials, which are homogeneous. Okay, and then we, uh, we would like to study the graded minimal free resolutions of I. Okay, so what is this here now? This is um, a complex here, which encodes all the important homological and algebraic information of this ideal. In general, you can set here to be uh, any module over S. Okay, but at the moment, just let's uh, consider the case when it is a homogeneous ideal. So what you are doing, we know because of Hilbert basis theorem, every ideal in a polynomial ring is finitely generated. Okay, so this ideal has some certain finite set of generators. Okay, let's say it is generated by some polynomials, M polynomials. What you do here, you take m copies of s, okay, direct sum uh, of uh, s uh, m times, okay. So in principle, this is what you have, okay. And then here you can define the canonical basis. 
so for example, E1 will denote, let's say one, blah, blah, blah, zero everywhere and so on. So in general, EI as a canonical vector here, this is in the i position and so on. These are uh, the generators for this direct product because identity would generate the ring itself. Okay, and then to each of these generator, you map it to a dis distinct generator of your ideal. So E1 goes to e, uh, F1, E2 goes to F2, and so on. EM goes to FM. It's a surjective homomorphism again. You look at the kernel. Okay, so after this one, what you do, once you define this map by mapping generators to the generators here, you look at the kernel. Now kernel, we don't know. This is called this first series. We don't know what could be the, the generators there in general for special classes of ideals here. One can describe these kernels a little bit better. Uh, and then after that, this kernel is again an ideal. You take the minimal set of generators for this kernel, and then you repeat the process and construct uh, uh, here uh, certain copies of polynomial rings again, and then you continue this process. Okay, there are different methods uh, to be uh, to construct this um, what we call graded minimal fee resolution. Now, wh why uh, uh, what we uh, what I want to describe here is the following. So here you have this certain resolution where these numbers that we call Betty numbers they are of crucial importance because they encode all the information uh, about the degree of the generator, the size of the generating set for each CDG module that we construct at each step. Okay, and then this Kessel novo mumford regularity, um, the motivation to study this, uh, this, uh, this, this number, it comes from algebraic geometry. It is defined as to be the maximum difference of J minus I. So you compute all the Betty numbers, you look at the differences of this J and I, you want to compute the maximum. Okay, a lot of effort. Okay, and a lot of definitions involved and uh, a lot, uh, one needs to uh, make a good amount of effort to be able to understand uh, for a given class of ideal, what would be the regularity. Why are we talking about here? As I promised, I will not talk about, <laughs> to, uh, we will keep the talk basic. Uh, so the idea is the following. Um, just one last definition that we call the linear resolution. So this is your minimal graded free resolution. It is linear uh, when these betas are uh, given in a very nice form. So what happens here is the following, that each time in the kernel, the degree of the generators of kernel, it increases by one. It's a very special behavior. Okay, so one would like to know uh, that uh, when an ideal has, which kind of, which are classes of ideals have linear resolution? It's a lot of, uh, okay, algebraic techniques that one needs to apply to be able to study these things. Now we look at the next theorem. You have an edge ideal, okay, as a square free monomial ideal in degree two. It's a very well celebrated theorem of Froberg. Uh, that says that your edge ideal, a square free monomial ideal generated in degree two has a linear resolution if and only if you look at the associated graph, then you look at the complement of the graph. If the complement of the graph is cordial, uh, your ideal has a linear resolution. So this is a wonderful theorem, which uh, uh, basically relates that how this um, uh, uh, all this homological information about this uh, uh, edge ideal, which is essentially a square free monomial ideal degree two, how it can be easily described sorry, uh, in the form of the attached graph. So, for example, if you look at this graph, the complement of this graph contains only this edge two three. And it is, of course, cordial. So the cordial graph means that every cycle of length bigger than three should have a chord. Okay, so for example, this graph is itself cordial. So this being an edge is cordial. So it means when you will generate the uh, edge ideal associated with this graph, it will have a linear resolution, which would mean that its regularity is, is exactly two. So just a small uh, example that how 
this uh, information from the combinatorial structure can be used uh, uh, to, to interpret the algebraic properties you know, of these square free monomial ideals. Okay, now one more uh, kind of an ideal that we associate here. So we know the coloring of the concept of the coloring of graph. Sorry, I'm having a little bit problem with my tablet. Okay. So what is the coloring of a graph? Uh, as you might remember, so this is the assignment of a color to each vertex so that the adjacent vertices get different color. So for example, since one and four is an edge here, I need to assign two different colors to it. Okay. So what is the chromatic number of a graph? It is the minimum number of colors that needed to color the given graph such that all the adjacent vertices get a different color. So uh, for example, for bipartite graph, they are distinguished with the properties uh, that they are two colorable. So two colors are enough to be able, uh, so the chromatic number of bipartite graphs is two. So now uh, with this definition, let's look at the following combinatorial definition of a vertex cover. What is a vertex cover? You take a graph, uh, now a subset of the vertices, such that this subset intersect all the edges. That will be a vertex cover. Of course, you can take all the vertices of the graph. They will intersect all the edges, of course. But no, you, one would like to know the minimal, the smallest such sets that they intersect all the edges of the graph. This would be the minimal vertex cover. To each such vertex cover, because it's a, it's a set just like we did it before, you can attach a monomial. So the, um, in this is the elements that appear here, you can put them as the index uh, set of your monomials. And then you can generate an ideal with it. So for example, uh, here, what could be your uh, minimal vertex cover? If you take a set which includes one, this one will cover this edge, this edge, and this edge. Now, if I put four, this is a minimal vertex cover because one and four intersect all the edges. And then their vertex cover will be one, two, and three. Uh, another vertex cover will be four, two, and three, for example. So these are the minimal vertex cover. What you do, you generate an ideal. For one, four, you attach the monomial x14, x1, x2, x3, x2, x3, x4. And then you generate an ideal with it. This is called the cover ideal of the graph. Now this um, edge ideals and cover ideals have a very nice relation. So this edge uh, ideal, it can be written as the intersection of monomial prime ideal. This is one of um, the um, very well-known property uh, of square free monomial ideals because they are radical ideals. So they are intersection of prime ideals. Now in investigating a little bit more since they are monomial ideals, so they are intersection of monomial prime ideals. What are monomial prime ideals? They are just created by variables. So here, when you will look at the prime ideals whose intersection is this edge ideal, these prime ideals actually correspond to this minimal vertex covers. So they are uh, very much closely related. Now, uh, for example, this is one of the very nice theorem about this cover ideal. Finding a chromatic number of a graph in general for an arbitrary graph, uh, it's uh, not an easy problem. So there are certain upper bounds and lower bounds. Um, and uh, to, to, to find the right color of the graph, this is one of the core topics in graph theory involved in um, like scheduling problem, networking problem and so on. So here with this algebraic result, one can associate the chromatic number of a graph with an algebraic condition. You take the square free monomial, it's d minus one power for the minimum of d such that this monomial belong to the dth power of your cover ideal will give you the chromatic number of the graph. So it's a, a very nice relation here uh, where you can actually not only just answer the algebraic question by using combinatorial methods, you can also answer some combinatorial questions also uh, by using some um, uh, algebraic methods. And then the other classes of ideals that are commonly studied in uh, combinatorial commutative algebra, uh, the other classes of monomial ideals would be the following. So we have defined the edge ideals of a graph. These are degree two monomial ideals. Then we have generalized edge ideals. 
uh, then we have cover ideals, then uh, we also have D cover ideals. After that, we have associate, associated to a graph path ideals and then the generalized path ideals. Then, okay, this is coming from graphs and so on. And then for uh, simplicial complexes, you have Stanley Reisner ideals that we define ideal that you have facet ideals. Other than that, uh, because since we do not have time, there is another way of associating, looking at this monomial ideal is the following. You look at, uh, you, uh, you um, uh, study um, uh, posets and lattices. Okay, so for poset means partially ordered set. So there is also a very nice correspondence between uh, the posets uh, and then how you associate these monomial ideals to it. Okay, so the ideals that are coming from the posets. So you take a poset, you look at the longest chain, uh, the total order sets inside this poset, and then you associate a monomial to it. And then there is again, a very nice in, um, uh, interplay of the combinatorial property of the poset and the uh, algebraic properties of this monomial and uh, uh, square free monomial ideal and also the monomial ideal. Okay. Um, so, uh, so far we are just defining the, <clears throat> the ideals. I, I, I mean, because we need more algebraic, um, let's say definitions to be able to talk about more precise results. Uh, but in the last part of the talk, but uh, I would like to talk about some binomial ideals also. Uh, studying monomial ideal, especially square free monomial ideal, um, is uh, uh, in some sense easy because for square free monomial ideals, uh, in general for monomial ideals, we know the unique minimal generating set. For any given monomial ideal, we know that there is a unique minimal monomial generating set. So that makes uh, uh, your work uh, very easy to some extent. Okay, but as soon as you move to binomial ideals, okay, uh, we do not know such things. There are no unique uh, generating set. You can always, you can uh, change, uh, replace one mon mon uh, binomial generator with certain other binomial generators. So things become already very complicated once you are out from the class of monomial ideals. Once you enter into binomial ideals, things become much more complicated instantly. Okay, let's look at some special classes of binomial ideals. Here is a matrix, okay? It is a matrix six cross five, where all the entries are variables. Okay, linear algebra, we know how to define the determinant of the matrix, in particular, uh, the minors of a matrix. So uh, for example, here, if you take the second uh, and the fifth row, second and the fourth column, so, sorry, this highlighted blue entries, this, this gives you a two cross two matrix. So with this two cross two matrix, this is the determinant that is called a two minor. Okay, so you look at all the uh, two cross two sub matrices of your given matrix, and then you are just writing their determinants. This is a binomial, right? A binomial whose both components are square free in particular. Okay, the study of uh, all the two minors or all the three minors in general for all the T minors of a given matrix whose entries are all variable is uh, one of the very well-known topic in commutative ring theory and also in algebraic geometry. So the varieties associated to such ideals, they are called determinantal varieties. It's a, a, a very well-studied topic in algebraic geometry in particular. Now we would like to study some, uh, some specializations of it. So the motivation completely comes from algebraic geometry. That's why we are studying it. Okay, so you, what you do, you have a matrix. And then when you take all the two minors that you can write down with it, you generate an ideal. It is a well-known result that, okay, this binomial ideal is a prime ideal. So this can be seen, for example, as a toric uh, ideal of a certain toric ring. Okay, now what happens when uh, you pick uh, certain uh, entries in the matrix? So for example, I have this matrix, uh, five rows and four columns. And uh, I say that, okay, I don't want to study all the two minors. I want to study some two minors, okay? And then for example, the ones that are marked in the red color, 
okay? And then I would consider only those two minors such that they can be, I mean, they, they belong to these marked spread entries. So what can we say about such binomial ideals, for example? So the minor that correspond to this submetrix, I do not want that because it contains blue entry. I want to consider only those, um, where is the razor? Sorry. I want to consider only those minors uh, that have all the red entries. Okay. Uh, so I'm skipping a very long history here. So we have this ideal generated by two minors, in general T minors, which are determinantal ideals corresponding to determinantal varieties. Then people have studied their generalization as one-sided letters, two-sided letters coming from Jean W. And then uh, due to several motivations coming from algebraic statistics, the ideal generated by adjacent two minors. Okay, so by saying adjacent to minor, you are taking uh, this adjacent uh, submatrices and then computing their determinants. Uh, now, even further more generalization comes this one. We mark some entries, and then we would like to study what happens with the two minors of these, uh, these red entries. So for example, this one, uh, to be able to study this one, what we do, we attach this combinatorial structure that we call polyomino. It's a very well-studied, very popular topic in um, combinatorics and discrete mathematics. What is a polyomino? You have cells glued together. Uh, a very typical example, like you might have played Tetris at some point uh, as a child. So these are just these Tetris, you know, these uh, polyominoes dropping from the roof and then you have to find a nice arrangement. Uh, so these are polyominoes, uh, just the uh, squares, unit squares joined together in different shapes. Now, uh, so that was part of my uh, uh, PhD research work where I was able to create okay, a connection between the polyominoes uh, and the two minors of, of, of certain shapes inside the matrix. Okay, what is that? Let me... Uh, I think there is a, so for example, when you, when you look here, what do you have here? Here you have exactly uh, a polyomino. So this, uh, this, this shape here going in this direction, this is just a polyomino. So for every polyomino, you can embed this shape inside the matrix, and then you can call them the red entries. And then you would like to study what happens to this binomial ideal. Okay, so with this motivation, uh, what one would like to study for this binomial ideal? One would like to know the Grobner basis. Okay, for those of you who know, uh, I'm Grobner basis. So the idea is, uh, we do not have a unique minimal mono, uh, unique minimal generating set for binomial ideal. In general, okay, we do not know uh, given a given a random polynomial when does it belong to your ideal. For monomial ideal, we know that, okay, you just have to take this into consideration. In general, if you have a ideal generated by certain polynomials, you take another polynomial, when does it belong to your ideal? So this question, the question for the problem of ideal membership is answered through Grobner basis. Okay, it's a, it's a certain generating set of the ideal with some certain nice properties such that the generalized you, uh, division algorithm can be applied. And then one would like to know the scary minimal free graded resolution for these ideas. One would like to know the Betty numbers, the regularity. Uh, one would like to know more uh, algebraic properties, for example, when they are normal, Cohen, Macaulay, Gorenstein, et cetera, et cetera. So all the uh, homological and algebraic invariants and properties one would like to know. Now, so for example, again, when you have these red marked entries, uh, as I said before, so I can attach a polyomino to it, or given any polyomino, I can uh, uh, look at it as a, as a uh, certain shape inside the matrix. And uh, with this polyomino, the entries that appear here, I take all the uh, sub uh, two cross two matrices, and then I look at their uh, minors. So for example, here, uh, for this submatrix, 
I have the determinant x22 minus uh, x22 times x33 minus x23 times x32. Okay, so you have a matrix with variable entries. Uh, you uh, uh, you fix a certain polynomial, and then to that polynomial you embed it in your matrix, and then you can color those entries that correspond to the vertices of those polynomial, and then you would like uh, to generate an idea that correspond to those red entries, all the two minors that you can generate here. Okay, so for example, this is a polyomino ideal associated to this polyomino. Okay. Now, again, when we, uh, the first time when I studied this ideal, it was due to um, the motivation coming from like to extending this determinantal, uh, the theory of determinantal ideal, determinantal varieties. And again, as I said, the motivation came from algebraic geometry. Uh, but uh, in recent years, it changed quite a lot. So for example, when you have this ideal, in general, it does, it does not need to be a prime ideal. How do you know that this ideal is prime? Uh, for monomial ideal, it is easy. It should be generated by variables, otherwise it's not prime. For binomial ideal, it's not easy at all. Uh, how uh, can I know that, okay, if two monomials, uh, sorry, two polynomial, their product belongs to this ideal, then one of them should be here. Not easy to check. Then uh, finding their Grobner basis with different shape of polyominoes, again, not so easy. Now, as I said before, for a binomial ideal to see that if it is a prime ideal, then it sh we should be able to view it as a toric ideal. So if I can find a certain set of monomials uh, such that um, uh, this ideal can be seen, uh, sorry, such that this ideal is the defining ideal. So certain polynomial ring, let's say T quotient IP is isomorphic to such a monomial algebra. But how do you find this one? Again, not so easy. So the question that, okay, for what shapes of polyominoes this ideal is prime uh, is uh, the first question that comes uh, when, when we are studying the polyomino ideals. Some of the answers are known. For example, when we have a row convex polyomino, it means that you have a polyomino of, for example, uh, this shape. Uh, let's call it here. So whenever you have two cells in a row, you should have all the cells in between them. So it's a, it, like the, the intuitive concept of convexity. When you have two points, everything should be, between them should be inside there. Then simple polyominoes. It means polyominoes without a hole. So for example, if I take this polyomino, where all of these cells are inside, but this middle cell is not inside. It's a polyomino with a hole. There is a topological hole inside it. So if you do not have such holes, then they are again, um, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the associated polyomino ideal is prime. Then polyomino with convex hole. And then after that, uh, many other people have discussed this question of primality of this, um, polyominoes, but a complete characterization is still not known that for what uh, uh, necessary conditions that we need to have on our polyomino to be able to see that the polyomino ideal is prime. Okay. Moreover, one of the uh, nice um, interpretation of uh, the algebraic and homological properties of the polyomino ideal is the following. So uh, a quick recall, we, have, we, we talked about this minimal graded free resolution of an ideal, the regularity, uh, the length of such a res, uh, resolution is the projective dimension and so on. And it is already hard enough to study this when it is a monomial ideal. For binomial ideal, it is even, um, uh, even harder. Now, uh, apparently this uh, homological invariance regularity has a very nice interpretation when you are computing this regularity for a polyomino ideal. For example, here, this is a polyomino. And this is the matrix where it is embedded in. And now I have a polyomino ideal, which is generated by all the two minors that I can form here. Okay, so this is the polyomino ideal associated to it. We forget about the polyomino ideal. We just look at it as a polyomino. Now, uh, a uh, simple combinatorial problem. So given such 
shape that we know as a uh, fairer uh, diagrams in, in combinatorics. So you have, in some sense, uh, it looks like a ladder, a staircase, okay? Given such shape, how many rooks can you arrange? So rooks from chess, I don't know the, the, the Turkish name. So these are, so by saying putting a rook, so in each column and in each row, you should have only one rook, okay? So what is the maximal number of uh, rooks that you can put in such a chessboard configuration? So this can this volume you know, can be seen as a chessboard configuration, right? In chessboard, you have eight rows and eight columns. And then you you you you you cut it from the certain parts. Okay, you you have a pruned chessboard configuration. Now you want to put rooks in it. What is the maximal number of rooks that you can put in it such that in each row and in each column, you have exactly uh, at most one uh, uh, rook. So for example, here, if I put two rooks like this, I cannot put a third one. I've covered all the rows and all the columns. Uh, but if I put it like this in a different arrangement, I can put four of them. The question is, can I put five of them given such a uh, given this shape? Is it possible to put five rooks in it? Um, what do you think? Can, can, can we find a certain arrangement to be able to put more than four rooks? So for example, if I put in this way, two is the maximum. If I change my arrangement here, four is the maximum. Can I put five? Uh, intuitively, it seems no, we cannot. Uh, this is the intuitive answer. But given certain shapes, sometimes you know your intuition in combinatorics it can be wrong all the time. So it's a little bit misleading. Would it be possible or not? And then you know, let's say you have now a uh, hundred cross hundred size of chessboard, and then you are taking this kind of shape, and then how? What is the maximum number of rooks you can put in it? So in one of the recent results, we were able to prove actually the following. Uh, let RP be the maximum number of rooks that can be placed in your polyomino. Uh, so in a polyomino that we call a ferrer diagram, which looks like a one-sided ladder, then this is apparently equal to the regularity uh, of uh, the uh, quotient ring of the polyomino. So when you compute the minimal graded free resolution here, you look at uh, uh, uh, all the J minus I, the maximum of that, so the, the, the, the regularity, this is apparently exactly equal to the maximum number of rooks that you can put in your polyomino. And then the story does not really stop here. So for example, if I take this kind of polyominoes, now we have almost forgotten about the algebraic computations going on. We are looking at all the, like only the combinatorial part of these polyominoes. So for example, now I have this polyomino here. Uh, it is certainly different uh, from this one. Here I have a nice shape. It is, a, it is really like a staircase, okay, a ladder. This one is very different, but this one has a certain nice property that if you pick any two cells, you can go from one cell to the other just by making a one turn. This is in combinatorics called L convex polyomino. Similarly, one defines Z convex polyomino. And then in general, one defines K convex polyomino. So by saying Z convex from one cell to the other, you should be able to find a path with at most two turns. So again, for L convex polyomino, the regularity of the uh, quotient ring of the polyomino ideal happens to be equal to exactly uh, the maximal number of rooks that you can place. Okay, and then there are many other nice interpretations also, but I think I'm out of time. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if there are any questions. I have one. Uh, yes. Uh, could you go back to the uh, chromatic number formula for the graph that we work with? Uh, where was it? Sorry. Uh, uh, this one. Yes. 
uh, I don't think that I understood the set, Mindy. Uh, sorry? Uh, so uh, what does it mean, you mean, right? Yes. OK. Uh, uh, I'm trying to see uh, to whom I'm talking also. Uh, you say it, you say OK, OK, now I found you in the video, OK. <laughs> so um, what do we mean here? Let me remove these extra lines, OK. So we have this cover ideal, right? Mm -hmm. That uh, where was it? Here, this one. So you take minimal vertex cover of the graph. Uh, you attach these monomials to it, and then you generate this ideal, uh, cover ideal. Now you take power of this. So let me just simply denote it by j, just for. So let's say this is your ideal j. You are taking its powers. Okay. So first of all, these powers are not so easy to study. Why? Because this ideal is generated uh, in monomials that can have different degrees. For example, I think I wrote it here. Uh, so this ideal in this case is generated by x1, x4, x1, x2, x3, uh, x1, what was it? Two, three, and four. This is the cover ideal for this graph, okay? Then you are looking at the powers. Okay, by saying powers, it uh, uh, so when you are computing j square, it means u i u j, uh, where u uh, u i u j, where these uh, elements comes from the uh, generating set. So this is the generating set for the cover ideal. So you take product of all of these monomials. Okay, sometimes for some monomials, they these products can be the same. So for example, if you have um, uh, a, a monomial, um, let's say x1, x2, x3, x4, x1, x3, x2, x, uh, x2, x4, the product here and the product here are the same. So it is not so easy to say what, what are the minimal, uh, what is the minimal uh, monomial generating set for the powers, first of all. But in any case, we are considering the powers of this ideal. Okay, so we are just, we are just multiplying the generators to themselves among each other, uh, d times for the dth power. Uh, is, is, is, it, is it okay until here? Yes. Okay, then we take this monomial, which is the product of all the variables. So for example, uh, if you have four variables in your graphs, so you are taking this one and then the smallest d, for example, if this cube belong to the fourth power here, and then the square of this monomial uh, does not belong to j cube, then the chromatic number would be four. This is what it says. So you have to consider the powers of this ideal then you have to see that when such a product belongs to this power, and then you compute the, the, the, the minimum of it, the minimum power with, with this property. This, this okay, gives a, a characterization for the chromatic number, but in, uh, in computational way, it is not that easy to compute <laughs> because first you are looking at the powers and then uh, how do you describe these powers? Uh, when do you know that uh, this monomial belongs here? Uh, it uh, does not simplify the problem completely. But nevertheless, there is a algebraic correction for that. Thank you very much. Okay. Aisha, can I ask a question? Uh, yes. You already said that this is not easy to compute, but is there any special thing about planar graphs in terms of this J column? Uh, for planar graphs, uh, no, not that I know of, no. Uh, the coloring number is four, right? So there should be something special about this coloring ideal then. Um, no, not that I know of for planar graph. Uh, that, um, okay, the covering number is four. Um, but uh, I, I think uh, when we, um, even for the edge ideal of the planar graph, uh, when we compute uh, the regularity, 
uh, as far as I remember, again, the exact values are not known, only some upper bounds. So it does not really make uh, this situation very easy, the standard property. Okay, for the chromatic number, yeah, I mean, because of this five pillar pyramid and four pyramid use these things, but uh, no, not that I know of for cover ideas, some some particularly nice results. Maybe some uh, for the algebraic or homological properties of cover ideas, maybe there are some upper bounds known for the regularity, et cetera, but not that I know. Thanks. <laughs> okay, do we have another question? Okay, Hojam, thank you so much again.